ignorance is a legal fiction. And that ignorance thereof will not excuse you. However, how can you indulge in the presumption that you're supposed to know the law if the law itself has not been published? So that provides the background for the case of Tanyada versus Tobera. And this is related to the guarantee of the right of the people to information on matters of public concern. The 1987 Constitution also makes reference to the right of the people to access papers, documents, and records regarding official acts, judgments, and other transactions. There's even a reference now to access to <coughs> research data that was utilized for government development, for policy development. And I think this has something to do with the Bataan nuclear plant before. So in the case of Tanyata versus Tobera, when Marcos declared martial law way back in the year when you were born, 1972, he started to issue presidential decrees and other presidential issuances. This had the effect of being laws themselves. Some of these decrees and issuances were not published. They were secret decrees. Through the years, however, some persons found themselves being hailed to court to answer to certain charges allegedly for violation of some of these presidential decrees, which were not published. So how would they know what they were supposed to have done, which was in violation of the laws when they never knew there were such laws in existence? The only time that they would learn that there were laws of this nature was when they were already in court. Eventually, Tanyada and company filed the case against Tobera for the publication of all laws. And in 1995, the Supreme Court, when Marcos was still in power, came up with that decision, saying that yes, laws have to be published in order that they become effective. But at that time, the Supreme Court only made reference to laws of general, general circulation or general effect. However, on motion for reconsideration, and which was decided at a time when Marcos was already gone, the Supreme Court said every law must be published, no matter that it might be private, local, or of general application. Because everyone has the right to know what kind of laws are being promulgated or being issued. So even if it's a private law, the citizens might also be interested to know who had been granted these favors. And in that case, I think the Supreme Court justices were particularly referring to the presidential decree that granted a nephew of Marcos Philippine citizenship. That's Michael Kion. Michael Kion then was the head of Gintong Ally, a sports program of the government, and it didn't look good that someone who is not a Filipino citizen should be heading that organization. So he was given Filipino citizenship. He's a nephew of Marcos because the mother was a sister of Marcos, but she was married to an Australian. So at that time, he got the citizenship of the father. Now Michael Kion is governor of Ilocos Norte. So he would not have been elected to that position were he not given Philippine citizenship years ago. And now I think he's running against Jaime Marcos. So it's cousins against each other. Anyway, that's politics, isn't it? With that pronouncement in Tanyada versus Tobera, there's now the need to publish laws. At that time, publication 
Guru knows was only through the official descent. But as you might be very well aware of, hardly anybody reads the official descent, especially law students. So maybe they might not even have seen a copy. And if they have seen a copy, they might just use it for wrapping some things, perhaps. Because it's all letters and they are uninteresting. They're boring. If you see pictures, they're pictures of the signs of certain things that are thought to be patented, for instance. So they're more technical than interesting. Therefore, Cory Aquino came up with Executive Order Number 200, which required publication to be done either through the official gazette or newspapers of general circulation. That would certainly make more sense. How about publication through the internet? In the case of Neri, you're familiar with that. There is a requirement under the 1987 Constitution that the rights of persons appearing or affected by legislative inquiries in aid of legislation should be respected and that the inquiry should be done in accordance with duly published rules. And in the case of Mary, the problem was the rules had not yet been republished. So they had been earlier published, but in so far as the Congress or the Senate that tried to investigate Mary, the rules had not yet been published. And we already discussed this in your in your sessions with Attorney Sandova. Did you did you not? What did you not remind him? Okay, let's go back to or through memory lane. You still remember the case of Arnold versus Sereno? In that case, the Supreme Court said that there's a difference between the Senate and the House of Representatives in regard to the length or duration in which a person cited in contempt may stay in jail. For the House, the period of imprisonment would be coterminous at most with the term of the House that sent the witness to prison. For the Senate, it could be much longer because the Senate is a continuing body. Why was it a continuing body while the House was not? For the House of Representatives, every time there was an election, the entire membership is up for election. For the Senate, only a portion would be up for election. So the rest would continue with the, the business of the Senate. Then in the 1987 Constitution, we revived the Congress with, again, a House of Representatives and the Senate. So you may have the first impression that the Senate under the 1987 Constitution would be just like the Senate of the 1975 Constitution. It should be a continuing body likewise. So in the case of Mary, let's assume that the rules regarding inquiries in aid of legislation were adopted during the first time that the new Congress convened. So let's say that's the 10th Senate or 10th Congress. Those rules have been duly published. Then you have after that the 11th Congress. The rules have not been republished since there were no amendments or revisions. After that, you would have the 12th Congress until the 13th Congress. So let's now say that it is during the 13th Congress that Mary is thought to be cited in contempt. Mary contended that 
that since there are no rules governing the inquiries in aid of legislation, then it cannot be cited in contempt. How would he claim that there are no rules when the rules had been adopted way back, let's say during the 10th Congress, and it was just continued from the 10th until the 13th Congress? Here, you would now see the point if you refer to the separate concurring opinion of Justice Carpio. Justice Carpio said that the Senate under the 1987 Constitution is no longer a continuing body. So what if it's no longer a continuing body? Then its Senate or its Congress would be considered as different from the previous Senate. Therefore, there will be a need to republish, even if they adopt the old rules, there is a need to republish the same, because they would not be the rules of the new incoming Senate until adopted and republished. Without republication, it's as if you would have no rules governing inquiries in aid of legislation. So why is the 1987 Senate no longer a continuing body? It's no longer a continuing body because unlike the 1935 Senate, every time that there is an election, one half of the total membership of the Senate would be up for grabs. Whereas under the 1935 Constitution, only one third would be up for election. So what difference does it make? You still have a part of the Senate left behind. Yes, but one half would not constitute a quorum. So if they cannot constitute a quorum, then they could no longer conduct their business. This was subsequently further expounded on by the court majority in the resolution of the motion for consideration in the case of Nelly, where the Supreme Court said the Senate is both a continuing and a non-continuing body. So how is that? It is a continuing body in the sense that the institution is not dissolved with every election. However, it is not a continuing body insofar as the conduct of its day-to-day -day business is concerned. So what would that mean? It means that if there are any pending businesses at the time the Senate comes to an end, those would not be carried over to the second to the subsequent Senate. So let's say that during this Senate, this Congress, there are several bills awaiting third reading. But because of the election and what happens after that, the term of this present Senate would come to an end by the end of June. And those bills awaiting third reading have never been subjected to third reading. So by July, the fourth Monday, there will now be a new Congress with a new Senate. This new Senate cannot consider the bills immediately for third reading because they cannot continue what ended with the previous Senate. So if they want to consider these bills once more, they would have to start again from step one, first reading and so on. They cannot simply they could not simply try to approve the bills on third reading. Because in so far as the previous Senate is concerned, everything came to an end with it. This was also this also had some ratification or ramification in the case of League of Cities regarding the attempt to make use of the deliberations during a previous Congress to try to interpret the meaning of a law that is passed subsequently. The Supreme Court said, since Congress is not a continuing body, then you cannot make use of the deliberations in a previous Congress to construe the meaning of a law that was passed after, because that would not be the same Congress 
that passed the law. So whatever was said in that previous Congress would not be reflective of what would have been the intention of the Congress that finally passed the law. In uh, Garciliano, the need for publication was again highlighted. So given the fact that in Mary, the Supreme Court acknowledged that there was a need to republish the old rules even if there was no amendment to those old rules. In Garciliano, the Supreme Court said, since at the time when Garciliano was sought to be cited in contempt, the rules had not yet been republished, then there were no rules that, have, that could have governed the manner by which he would be cited in contempt and sent to prison. Accordingly, there was no basis to cite him in contempt. Nevertheless, in that case, at the time when this case was pending before the Supreme Court, the Senate finally republished the rules. So the court said from that time on, the rules became effective. However, they could not have any retroactive effect. So still, Garciliano would not be cited in contempt in regard to that first time that he was made to appear and he refused to cooperate. The rules only became effective after that. They could not have a retroactive effect. Now, going back to the issue about publication in the Internet. In the separate opinion of Justice Carpio, in the case of Derry, he also made reference to the fact that these Senate rules are found in the web page of the Senate. So is that not enough publication? He said, no, because that's not among the recognized means of publishing the laws or rules. And this was subsequently regulated by the court by way of majority decision. I think in uh, the solution of the motion for reconsideration in, in the case of Perry, as well as in Garciliano. In Garciliano, there was reference to the fact that under the electronic evidence law, there's already recognition of this mode of communication. But the Supreme Court said that law would have something to do with the admissibility of electronic evidence, not with regard to publication of laws. So the implication is, it may be if Congress allows publication through the Internet. Because as you are now well aware, more and more people are consulting the Internet for a lot of their needs. So it's very easy for the people to check on what would be the latest when it comes to the laws if they browse the Internet. So if the publication through the Internet may become a very convenient means to inform the people. But in the meantime, that there's yet no law which allows for the same. Publication must still be done through the usual ways, which is the printed form through the official cassette or these papers of general circulation. In regard to elections, we have that case of Bantai Public Act 7941 regarding the demand of the petitioners that they be informed of the personalities behind the party list organizations. This was in 2007. If you still remember, there was some issue regarding representation of some party list organizations which apparently violated the spirit of the party list system. But again, if you remember, during that time, 
It was reported that a brother of the chairman of the Comelec, a professional, was supposed to be the nominee of a party list organization composed of ballot vendors. So how could he be representing such a group? But you would never know whether he's really is the nominee of that group or not if you don't know who the nominees are. And right now, you have the son of the president running under the party list system, supposedly representing security guards. So, in that case of Bantai Republic Act 7941, the petitioner asked the Comelec to name the nominees of the party list organizations. Comelec said no, we cannot do that because under the law itself we are prohibited from doing that. The only thing that we are supposed to do is to come up with the list of the party list organizations. The Supreme Court said, Comelec, you misread the law. The law that the provision of the law that you're referring to has something to do with the reg or the certified list that is to be posted at the police or the precinct during election day. This is the list from which the voter is supposed to determine who among or which of the party list organizations he or she would be voting for. So, since under the party list system, it is the party or the organization that is voted for, then there's no need to identify who the nominees are. However, it does not also mean that the Comelec cannot or is prohibited from disclosing the list of the nominees if this is requested from it. Because it is part of the right of the people to information that they know who are the men or women behind these party list organizations so that they can properly exercise their right to choose which to vote for or which to vote into office. So that's the case of Bantai Public Act 7941. The laws need to be published. If the law says effective upon approval, does it mean to say that it really becomes effective upon approval? In the case of Umari, the Supreme Court said no. Even if the law says effective upon approval, you still have to have it published and then you start counting 15 days. Publication is indispensable. In the case of the Bugal Balan, the Supreme Court <coughs> said that if the law says effective immediately, it does not also dispense with publication. However, you only need to publish and that law already becomes effective immediately. No need to count 15 days. Under Tanyata, all that is required is publication for the law to be effective. Is it possible that the law that has been published would still be ineffective? That happened in the case of Benson versus Freelon. And here again, you can very well appreciate the creativity and imagination of the Supreme Court. In this case, Mark Moss issued Presidential Decree Number 644, which ostensibly repealed Republic Act Number 39 or 3595, a law which provided for automatic adjustment of the pension benefits of retired members of the Supreme Court and the Court of Appeals. So it affected their own income. This presidential decree was eventually published, but it was after several years, more than five years, I think. And it appeared in a backdated issue of an official Gazette supplement. It was only published 
after the case of Tanyada v. Cobera had already been filed with the Supreme Court. So take note of this circumstances. Under PD 644, that particular Republic Act was repealed. Therefore, when the Congress under the 1987 Constitution was constituted, it passed a bill reviving that Republic Act that was repealed by PD 644. Cory Aquino, however, vetoed the bill. The case went up to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court practically told both the President and Congress that they were ignorant. How would that be? To the President, the Supreme Court said, what were you trying to veto? What you had been trying to veto is not a bill. It's actually an existing law. You cannot do that. To Congress, the Supreme Court said, what were you trying to revive? The law that you're trying to revive had been there all along. So how did that happen? That law has already been repealed by PD 644. The Supreme Court explained. Let's take a look at PD 644. PD 644 was one of those so-called secret decrees. So it was never published until after several years. And it appeared in a backdated supplement to the official gazette. It was only published after the case of Tanyada v. Tobera had already been filed with the Supreme Court. So what difference does it make? It was still published. That's all that matters, isn't it? The Supreme Court said, because of these circumstances, the publication was done in bad faith. And since it was in bad faith, that was not a valid publication. Who would ever have thought of bad faith publication except the Supreme Court? So that's the case of Benson v. Milon. Administrative circulars would also have to be published if, for instance, they supplement or they implement a law. But if the circulars are merely internal or interpretative, then there is no need. And as we have discussed yesterday, when it comes to administrative circulars, there's also a new requirement pursuant to the Administrative Code of 1987. That is, that they must be filed with the Office of the National Administrative Register. Otherwise, they don't become effective. You can not rely on them for as long as they have not yet been filed in accordance with the Administrative Code of 1987. In regard to EO-464, the Supreme Court noted in that case that even as EO-464 was supposed to be internal, governing the officials and employees of the Executive Department, considering that it implicated the right of the people to information, then it should have been published before it became effective. If you remember, EO-464 became effective on the very day that it was issued, the day that Udani and Balutan appeared before the Senate for its inquiry in aid of legislation. So, EO-464, the Supreme Court said, should not have been made effective on the very day that it was issued. It should have been published first. Anyway, that has already become moot and academic. 
when you would now become lawyers. You are expected to continually update yourselves. Because if you don't, then you can only blame yourselves if you did not take note of latest developments and which may be prejudicial to your client. This is illustrated by the case of the Roy. Here, the lawyer failed to take note of what was brought about by the so-called Habaluya's doctrine. And because of that, the appeal was not filed in a timely manner. The lawyer said, well, it's not my fault because unlike laws, Supreme Court decisions are not published in the newspapers. It's just the parties to the case who are furnished a copy of the decision. So, how am I supposed to have known this new doctrine? Supreme Court said, notwithstanding that, if you are a practicing lawyer, then you must find ways by which you can update yourself. So the mere fact that decisions of the Supreme Court are not published in the newspapers like laws, the same is not an excuse. You can update yourself through this crap, through the advanced sheets or advanced decisions of the Supreme Court, through the official gazette, as well as law journals. In so far as the SCRA is concerned, at the time when this case was decided in 1988, the SCRA, I think, was delayed about a year. Now, the SCRA is delayed about four to six months only. In 1988, the official cassette was also delayed by about two years, in so far as Supreme Court decisions are concerned. And not all the decisions of the Supreme Court are published in the official itself. In regard to advanced sheets or advanced decisions, those copies are normally available only in the Supreme Court. You don't normally see them elsewhere. So if you were a lawyer practicing in the provinces, you may have to go to the Supreme Court to obtain a set every month. And every month, the Supreme Court comes up with about 150 decisions. So if you were to obtain the mimeograph copies, perhaps that would be a foot and a half thick. So you would go home to your province and start reading. By the time you're done reading, by the time you would have updated yourself, then it would be time to go back to Manila. <laughs> And get another set and keep doing that. When will you start practicing? When it comes to journals, only a few would also be published. And that depends now on the choice of the editors as to which cases might be important in, from their point of view. So these were some of the problems then. But the Supreme Court still expected lawyers to update themselves. And therefore, if they did not, then they would be liable for the negligence or the failure to properly take care or advance and protect the interest of the of their clients. So now we have a semi-white lady. <laughs> Nowadays, more than 10 years later, you're now well aware that you can update yourself quite fast through the internet. Normally, the Supreme Court decisions may be delayed but by about a few days from the time that they're reported or from the time that they are promulgated to the time that they're posted in the web page of the Supreme Court. But if they are quite important cases, 
They may be updated on the same day or the day after. Just like the case of the Castro versus JBC. The problem with the web is that reading after several hours may also strain your eyes. You may, have, you may have updated yourselves well, but then you may have difficulty applying what you've read because now you would have difficulty with your eyesight. <laughs> but again, since you choose this profession to be in, then pay the price, right? For some, anyway, they just need to have the title which they can attach to their vehicles. Lawyer. <laughs> so even if they're not practicing, for as they're lawyers, then they would, that would be a bra part of their bragging rights, right? But they really get out of those plates. Assassination. And take note also about this web web versions of the Supreme Court decisions. Sometimes they do not accurately reflect what would eventually find print. Take a look at the case of Razon versus Tagitis, for instance. That's a December 2009 decision. You would notice that the web copy would have footnote 45 and all of a sudden, it already jumps to footnote number 50. So, 46 to 49 are missing. And if you take a look at the printed copy, there really is a missing part that consists of about a paragraph and a half. If you take a look at the case of, I think, Herrera versus Sandigan Bayan decided February 13, 2009, you compare it with what appears in this graph. You will notice that the paragraph just before the dispositive portion, as well as the dispositive portion itself, had been slightly altered. So, if you just cut and paste from the internet copy, and your opponent might notice that there's a discrepancy between what you have quoted in your bidding and what actually appears in this graph. You might just ask that you decided in contempt for misrepresenting to the court. <laughs> actually, it's not your fault, but since it does not conform to what appears in this graph, then the judge might suddenly start thinking also, why is it that your quotation does not reflect what is actually in this graph? So you better be ready to explain. And you can say, I lifted it from the internet. <laughs> Even the US Supreme Court decisions, there is a disclaimer there which says that in case of a conflict between the different versions of the Supreme Court decisions, as reported in the web, for instance, or in other unofficial <coughs> publications, what prevails would be the official printed copy as appearing in the United States Supreme Court reports. That's what you see as U.S. The other citations are lawyer's edition and Supreme Court reporter. So if there are any discrepancies, you consult the U.S. reports. Of course, the U.S. reports is not available here, but you may see a copy in the UP Law Center. So that is about updating. What happens if someone goes the other extreme? That's a case of state prosecutors versus Moro. Judge Moro was a presiding judge of a branch of the RDC Manila where dollar solving charges against Imelda were pending. 
while these cases were before his sala, there was a report in the broadcast and print media that the Central Bank came up with a new circular which already lifted the ceilings on or the limitations on dollar deposits. So what Judge Morrow did was immediately take judicial notice of this new Central Bank circular and dismissed Voto Proprio, the charges against Imelda. He did not even give the prosecution a chance to comment or oppose. So the state prosecutors went to the Supreme Court complaining about Judge Morrow. Judge Morrow was paid to explain and he said, what's wrong with what they did? I just took judicial notice of something new which had been reported in the papers, in radio and television. And that is that the Central Bank had already lifted these limitations on dollar deposits. The Supreme Court said you should have waited for the official copy. What difference does it make? The Supreme Court explained that if the judge waited for the official copy, he would have found out that there was a fine print. What was the fine print? It did not apply to pending cases. <laughs> so because of that, he was dismissed. Yes. Anyway, he filed a motion for reconsideration, and after several months, the Supreme Court perhaps took pity on him and reinstated him, only to be dismissed once more in a certain other case some years later. Why? What did he do? Before him again was another criminal case involving a drug squid. She was charged with a non-bailable offense. So what this drug squid requested is that she be allowed to, to be confined in the hospital because she was sick. So the judge allowed her. She was given 30 days, and towards the end of the 30-day period, she asked for an extension. And the judge again nonchalantly granted it. Then it was reported in the papers that this drug squid was caught at the casino floor gambling. <laughs> so the Supreme Court took notice of this and ordered an investigation of the judge. And they found out that he was not equal to the task because he practically let the drug squid's doctor to dictate the result of the investigation. So he did not ask questions that could have determined whether there was really a need to confine her still in the hospital or not. And because of that, the Supreme Court dismissed him. So that's the case of Judge Morrow. In regard to judicial records, take note of what the Supreme Court said in the case of Pilato v. Reyes. Here, the Supreme Court said that court orders and decisions are open to the public. They are public property. Therefore, the public can access them. However, when it comes to private pleadings and their attachments, then only those who have lawful business, lawful concerns about these pleadings may have access to them. For instance, you have a very rich neighbor who dies. The state proceedings are then instituted. And you go to court and ask to see the pleadings to determine, for instance, how much was his net worth when he died. Under this rule, you cannot give your only interest is curiosity. You have no claim against your neighbor. So what's your business? No matter that you might have been worth billions or whatever, 
since you have no claim against his estate, then you have no business trying to find out all of these details. When it comes to cr or violent crimes against women and their children, you have, of course, the new rule, as exemplified in the case of AAA versus Carbonell. The need to protect the identity of these women victims. This started with the case of Cabal Quinto way back in 2006. So now, in cases like this, the names of the victims are no longer identified. Generally, they are identified as AAA. In one recent case, what the Ponente did was to make use of the generic name Maria. So if your name is Maria, you're in danger. <laughs> In regard again to right information, one area in which you may have no access would be when there is a valid invocation of executive privilege. That much we learned from the case of Senator Philippines, Neri, as well as at Bayern. In regard to diplomatic negotiations, you have of course that whole case of People's Movement for Press Freedom versus Maglapos, decided way back in the 1980s, when they tried to find out what was happening during the negotiations between the Philippines and the U.S. panels relative to the possible extension of the U.S. bases in the Philippines. The Supreme Court said in that case, and by way of an extended minute resolution, that this is understood to be confidential. So the people would only have the right to know the, the finished product, but not the negotiations or what is happening in the meantime. Because if the people were made to know, then they may affect the outcome of the negotiations because the negotiators may no longer be that open and candid with each other. They will be more guarded in their discussions, their offers and counter offers, because they know that the people are look, looking over their shoulders. But if they were just by themselves, certain that nothing would leak out, then they could be more candid about that. Perhaps you can relate that to your own personal experiences when you're talking about your professors, isn't it? <laughs> If you trust the persons, the, your classmates that you are talking to, then you can be very open about your criticism, how you hate your professors. But if you know that someone in that group is likely to be reporting about what you are saying, then you would come up with something of an entirely different nature. You may be a little bit critical, but it would not be a faithful expression of what you really feel. So, if you have that experience, then you can appreciate what was said by the Supreme Court in that case of People's Movement for Press Freedom. It was just a minute resolution in that case. In the case of Akbayan, this became the core of an extended and, and a decision that elicited a lot of dissenting opinions. So in Akbayan, it's now a full decision. And they now expounded on what they said in that minute resolution in Manglapos. And they reaffirmed the holdings of Manglapos. So they recognized a historic confidentiality of diplomatic negotiations. In that case, therefore, the Supreme Court said, the people may only know the finished product, but not what must 
between the parties during the negotiations, the initial offers and counter offers and the like. That buy-in has something to do with the so-called JPEPA, Japan-Philippines Economic Partnership Agreement. Because it is a claim of some of the oppositors here that under that agreement, the Philippines may become a dumping ground for the toxic wastes of Japan. So perhaps to to highlight and to buttress their claim, they wanted to know what were really the offers and counter offers between the negotiators. But the Supreme Court cannot do that. In regard to infrastructure projects and the negotiations, we have thus the cases of Chavez. And the ruling in these cases is that while the government panel is still trying to collect and collate the different positions of the government agencies involved, then the people would have no right of access yet. They, would have, they wouldn't have a right to be informed as to what this is. But the moment the government panel has already consolidated and come up with a position, in negotiating with the other side, then the people would now have a chance to know what that position is. They don't have to wait for an agreement to be signed because the Supreme Court said it may already be too late. So if they already know the position taken by the government, they can already take whatever action is necessary if they're opposed to the same. Whereas if they have to wait, then it would be so much more difficult to undo what should have not been done in the first place. In regard to commercial and trade secrets, you have the case of Air Philippines versus Pensewell. Air Philippines ordered certain lubricants from Pensewell. Then it refused to pay for them, saying that it had been defrauded into ordering products that it already had in its inventory. It's just that they are under a different brand. So if they knew that what Pensewell was offering were the same as what Air Philippines already had, it would not have ordered the same. For the purpose of proving its defense, Fence well, or Air Philippines, ask that Fence well disclose the components of those substances, those lubricants. So through discovery, Air Philippines said, tell us what are the components of these lubricants of yours. Fence well said, we cannot do that. They are trade secrets. They are industrial secrets. The Supreme Court said, yes, in the absence of any compelling reason, you cannot, com you cannot require another party to disclose what, <coughs> what would be its trade or industrial secrets. Because those have proprietary value. For as long as they are only known to the owner, then the owner can exploit them for its business purposes. But the moment that you disclose those secrets, then they would no longer have that value for the owner. In this particular case, the Supreme Court said, Air Philippines can very well prove its defenses without having to compel Pensewell to disclose its trade or industrial secrets. Now let's proceed to right of association. This is also a very important right, and under the U.S. Bill of Rights, it's not explicitly provided for, but it is deemed to be subsumed under the First Amendment, particularly the guarantee of freedom of speech, because association is also a form of expression. You don't normally associate 
or join groups in which you don't like the members. You associate with persons who share your own ideas, your own interests, and other similarities. So you don't join those of different ideologies, for instance, or those who you think are not like you, except perhaps if you're all hypocrites and politicians. <laughs> In which case, you have to pretend to like each other for election purposes only. And if ever you walk, you will win subsequently, then you would go your separate ways, you know? Anyway, you already achieved your goal of getting elected. Take a look at the 2000, 2007 senatorial candidates. It was supposed to be the opposition who obtained the majority, you know? But after the elections, you didn't even know what now were they, their political affiliations. So association is a form of expression. And moreover, through association also, if you can pool your resources, when you could be more and not simply be an isolated person, then you can achieve more. You may have all the right ideas. You stand in one street corner and nobody will pay attention to you except perhaps to think that you are crazy. But if you were joined, let's say, by 500 others, then people would start noticing what you're talking about. Regarding association as an expression, let's talk about the case of United States or <clears throat> Boy Scouts of America versus Dale. And for that, you may ask yourselves, what are boys supposed to develop into when they become older? There's a musical group with that name, huh? Boys to men. <laughs> that also is the philosophy behind the Boy Scouts movement. In this case, Dale, a scout leader, one day came out of the closet and openly admitted that he was gay. So what the Supreme Court did was to promptly kick him out. And he complained. He said, I have the right to stay with the Boy Scouts. <laughs> so the case went up all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court and the Supreme Court said, you cannot insist on staying in the Boy Scouts because your presence contaminates the message. <laughs> in what way? The Boy Scouts being gay is not right. It is not straight. It is not clean. Therefore, if you have someone who is openly a homosexual, then it, his presence or what his presence might mean would be at cross purposes with what the Boy Scouts is trying to project. Therefore, one who is homosexual cannot insist on being part of the Boy Scouts movement mm -hmm. according to the, or at least the Boy Scouts Association, according to the decision of the Supreme Court. I think when this case was decided, it was somehow criticized, especially because of its apparent bias against homosexuals. Nevertheless, it may have more practical value if we correlate it to a Philippine case that was decided about the same time, or shortly after that, Ordinario versus People. This is about a high school teacher, a male high school teacher of Boy Scouts in Makati. He was found guilty of sexual assault of several counts because he repeatedly placed his 
instrument in the wrong receptacle several times. So you can just imagine, if you had an openly gay scout leader, and you had your young boys go out with them on a big walk or some other outdoor activity where they sleep overnight in some isolated places, would you be able to sleep well at night? So perhaps that also has practical considerations. And more and more, the reports about pedophilia, isn't it? Okay. Including priests as well as Boy Scouts. In regard to government employees, they may organize, so they may form associations, but they cannot go on concerted activities like strikes. Basically, the reason is because of the difference in government employment and private employment. When you're in the private sector, you are normally employed by a corporation that is motivated by the desire to generate profits. But when you are with the government, it is public service. So profit is out of the question. When corporations generate profits, it is not merely the result of what management has done. The workers also have a part in that. So it is only fitting that when the corporation has profit, then the employees should also have a part of the of the pie, isn't it? And if the employer is stingy in sharing portions of the pie, then the employees can pressure that employer to give more and not simply try to give everything to itself. And that is where the weapon of strike or concerted activities may come in. So, for the private sector that is that is powered by the desire for profit, they might as well share what they gain with those who help them in achieving that goal. But in the government, it is about public service. And those employed in the government cannot negotiate with the government itself, as represented by Congress, which is the one normally in charge of determining the terms and conditions of those in the government service. So the, ex the explanation as to the difference why those in the private sector may strike but those in the government would not. Because if those in the government were allowed to strike, then they may prejudice the delivery of public service. Finally, before we leave this discussion on association, let's take that case of Henry Marshall and Leon. He was already a lawyer at the time when the IBP was organized way back in the 70s. And he claimed that the right to associate includes the right not to associate. Therefore, he should not be forced into being part of the IBP. Particularly, that requirement that he should also be paying his IBP dues. The Supreme Court said, you're not being forced to join an association that you're not yet a member of. The moment you became a lawyer, you were already part of this association. At that time, it was still a loose association, but now it's being organized into a national organization pursuant to the police power of the state. In any event, you're not being forced to attend the meetings of your fellow lawyers. You don't need 
to go and show your face. But we need to see the face of your money. So if you're not willing to do that, we're sorry, but we're going to remove your name from the role of authorities. And that precisely is what happened in the case. <coughs> Now let's talk about eminent domain. Take note of what the Supreme Court has recently referred to as the cleansing effect of expropriation proceedings. So under the cleansing effect, the moment a property has been acquired through expropriation proceedings, it would have the effect of cleansing it of any problems regarding title to that property. Compared, for instance, to acquiring it through sale. In the case of sale, it may happen that you acquired it from someone whose title is questionable. Therefore, if there's someone who really owns the property, aside from the one from whom you bought the property, then that real owner can go after you. When it comes to expropriation, however, this would already be precluded. Why? Because of the cleansing effect of expropriation. Why would there be a cleansing effect? There will be a cleansing effect because it is a proceeding in REM. So the whole world is supposedly advised about the expropriator obtaining this property from particular individual or individuals. So anybody whose right may be prejudiced should show up or his claim would already be precluded. So that's a cleansing effect of expropriation proceedings as discussed in that case of Manotok Reality versus CLT Reality Development Corporation. In regard to or eminent domain also, take note of the expanding meaning given to the term public use. In the case of heirs of Pancho Ardona. The heirs opposed the expropriation of their property because they said the intended use would not be public use. Why? The property was sought to be expropriated to form part of a sports complex, particularly a golf course. In that in that case, the heirs claim that a golf course is not public use. Why? Public use is supposed to be something that's open to the public, but a golf course would only be open to those who can afford, meaning those who would have more money. Only the rich would be able to make use of the golf course. So how would you classify that as public use? Here, the Supreme Court said public use has already assumed and a broader meaning. In the past, it might have referred to one in which the public in general would benefit, like roads and bridges. But nowadays, public use could be identified with public interest, public benefit, public welfare. It's true that the golf course would not be open to everyone. Only those who can afford would be able to use it. But it also advances the public interest, the public convenience, by, for instance, generating jobs, generating income. And the outlying areas would also benefit by perhaps generating business. So all of this would work to the advantage of the community, and that can be considered as public use. In Manoska, 
the birthplace of Felix Manalo, the founder of Iglesia de Cristo, was sought to be expropriated to be converted into a national historical landmark. So again, there was a, an objection saying that this is not public use and it's not a valid use for the power of eminent domain. And moreover, it would be violating the establishment clause because you're now trying to set up something for a religious leader. The Supreme Court said, no, it is not about religion. Here, we are only trying to commemorate and memorialize the fact that one such person had a tremendous effect on Philippine society. While it is true that he founded Iglesia Ni Cristo, the point in coming up with this national historical landmark, however, is to point out that this is the place where a man who had great effect on Philippine society was born. So religion is beside the point because it cannot be denied that Felix Manalo had influenced Philippine society in a significant way. Therefore, the conversion of his first place into a national historical landmark. Take note also about the stages of the expropriation proceeding. And the reason for that is so that you can know when to act under particular circumstances. The first stage is, for, is only for the purpose of determining whether the expropriator can exercise the power that it has and whether the property falls within its authority. So the question may be asked, can this expropriator take this property? If the answer is yes, then that's the end of the first stage. The next stage will now be the determination of just compensation. If the owner of the property does not agree with the order of the court for the first stage, then he should already appeal and not wait for the final order in regard to the second stage. Because by that time, it would already be too late. The first stage order would already have become final and executory. It would no longer be questioned. After the first stage and there is no question raised, the only thing that the last owner would be able to question after that would be the amount of just compensation. So if he disagrees with the order for his property to be taken, he must already take appropriate steps by appealing. And also the Supreme Court has said that the answer or the opposition that is filed in regard to the complaint for expropriation should not be treated the same way like ordinary answers, that they are deemed to theoretically recognize the, the validity of the complaint or of the statements in the complaint. No, because this is the way by which you now join the issues. You don't necessarily admit that the expropriator is, expro is using its power in accordance with law or otherwise. You're actually trying to oppose it. And the normal way is by coming up with that kind of an opposition or an answer. So you don't necessarily admit that your property is subject to expropriation. In regard to judicial oversight over expropriation proceedings, when it comes to the question of necessity, the courts may look into that. 
but only if the power is being exercised by a delegate. If it is exercised by the national government or the legislature, for that matter, then it becomes a political question. That was the explanation given by the Supreme Court in the case of Manapat, but this goes a long way even to that case of Chinese cemetery. You still remember? When they tried to extend Rizal Avenue, and that would have passed through a portion of the Chinese cemetery, an issue that was raised was whether it was really that necessary, considering that the Chinese cemetery is already devoted to public use. And the Supreme Court said, yes, the courts can determine if there is necessity. Because here, it's only the city of Manila that is exercising the power of eminent domain. But if it were the national legislature itself that exercised the power, then the courts would already be precluded from reviewing it. Because the courts would, or the legislature would already have determined that there is a necessity. So that should not be second guessed anymore by the, by the courts. In regard to the element of taking, we have that old case of Bula de Castelvi. The word taking appears to be very simple, and yet it took the Supreme Court some time just to resolve it. What happened in that case? The Republic entered the property, the concept of lessee, some ten years earlier. But towards the end of the tenth year, the Republic and the lessor couldn't see eye to eye anymore. So eventually, the government said, okay, we're going to expropriate your property. The owner, of course, would already be helpless in that regard. The Republic said, we're going to pay your property the value it had when we first took it. So that would be ten years a year. The owner said, no, pay the value at the time when you instituted the expropriated proceeding. That's the time that you took it in the concept of eminent domain. Who is right? For the purpose of determining who really is right, the Supreme Court had to analyze the elements of taking under eminent domain and taking under the concept of lease. The Supreme Court said there must be entry. In both instances, there was entry as a lessee or as expropriator. It must be for more than a momentary period. Same. And it must be under the authority of law. Same for both. It must deprive the owner of all beneficial enjoyments of ownership. And that is where the difference came. When the government took the property as a lessee, it did not deprive the owner of the incidents or the beneficial incidents and enjoyment of ownership. As a matter of fact, it recognized the right of the owner of the property by paying the rentals. However, under eminent domain, it already deprived the owner of the beneficial enjoyment of the incidents of ownership because it ousted the owner from the physical possession of the property. So in that case, the Supreme Court said, here the value must be determined at the time when the expropriation proceedings were instituted. It's the same piece of land. What difference would it make? Well, you have to understand that land values normally appreciate. Therefore, the value that the land had 10 years earlier would not be the value that it would have after 10 years. Moreover, 
improvements had already been introduced into the land. And these improvements would be also considered as part of the principal that would have to be paid for by the government. So the owner would receive more if the valuation is done at a later date. In regard to determination of just compensation, at the time when Marcos was still in power, he came up with a manner of determining just compensation that the Supreme Court upheld. What was the manner of determining just compensation? Just take a look at what is indicated in the tax declaration. How did the Supreme Court validate that manner of determining just compensation? The Supreme Court said it's just being fair and just. If the lot owner declares his property to be worth so much for purposes of declaring the tax or paying the tax thereon, then he should be bound to the same value of his land if that land would then be expropriated. Because it would be unfair that for purposes of taxation, he would undervalue his property, and then if the same property would have to be taken by the government, he suddenly turns around and says, wait, that property is actually worth much more. So he pays little in terms of taxes, and yet wants to gain so much if the property is taken. That's not fair, the Supreme Court said. And it seems to be logical, isn't it? <coughs> but sometimes logic also has its expiration dates. Because when Marcos was gone, the Supreme Court did not lose time declaring that manner of determining just compensation as unconstitutional. So you have that case of EPSA versus Dulai. The Supreme Court said determination of just compensation is a judicial function. It involves the use of discretion and judgment. It is not as simple as reading what is in the tax declaration. Because under the presidential decrees, even a grade school pupil can already tell you the amount of just compensation simply by seeing what is written in a tax declaration. Certainly, that's not how just compensation is determined. The Supreme Court reverted to the old way of determining just compensation, making use of commissioners to help assist the judge in finding out what really is just compensation. In regard to consequential damages, when do you factor in consequential damages? Just compensation is supposed to be the payment that represents the value, the real value, the fair market value of the property taken from you. So when do consequential damages come in? If only a portion of your property is taken, then there may be occasion to talk about consequential damages. How? Let's say that your property is around 10 hectares and it is worth 100 million pesos. The government needs only half of your property, 5 hectares. So, theoretically, that's worth 50 million pesos. That means that the government would pay you that much for the value of one half of your property. Theoretically, also, that would mean that the remaining half with you would be worth 50 million because it's half of the original value for the entire property. What if, by virtue of that expropriation, 
your property which is now lesser would also have a lesser value than one half. Because it has been cut into half, the remaining half may not be as valuable as when it was still part of the whole. So instead of being worth 50 million, it's now worth only 40 million. So 10 million would be the consequential damage. And that should also be paid for by the expropriator because it represents the real loss in so far as the owner is concerned. This is also not un it's not also fair to the owner that it should it would be left with the property which has been devalued precisely because of the expropriation. What about if instead of decreasing in value the property now becomes 75 or worth 75 million pesos because of the anticipated benefit that would arise from the expropriation of the half. Does that mean to say that the owner would then have to pay back 25 million such, such that he would only actually be receiving 25 million from the expropriator? No it would still be entitled to the full value of the property because consequential benefits could only be deducted from consequential damages. If you allow consequential benefits to be also deducted from the principal amount, then there's a, even a possibility that the owner would be the one to pay the expropriator. Like in our example, because of that anticipated new project, as a result of that one half of the property being taken, the remaining half would then have a value of 110 million pesos. The whole was worth 100 million. Now, because of that expropriation and the project to which it would be devoted, the remaining half with the owner would be worth 110 million. Does it mean to say, therefore, that the owner would have to pay the expropriator 10 million? But he should be grateful that his property greatly appreciated? Of course not. Otherwise, it would be unfair to him. So, consequential benefits should only be deducted from whatever consequential damages there might be. In regard to the compensation and how it is to be paid, there is an initial amount to be given for purposes of transferring possession. Have we discussed it? Republic Act in 1974? Have you? We don't know about 1974. The problem with le lecturing this way is that I sometimes don't remember to whom I said certain things. <laughs> I don't remember if I already discussed it with you or not. 1974. Did, did we? Yeah. So to whom did I say that? I, I might already be hallucinating, right? <laughs> Under Rule 67 of the Rules of Court, which is the general rule regarding expropriation, the expropriator needs only to deposit the assessed value in order that possession would already be transferred to it. So it's deposited with the court. Under Section 19 of the Local Government Code, the expropriator needs to deposit 15% of the market value of the property for the same purpose of transferring possession. So here we are talking about transfer of possession only. Because 
the expropriator may need to use that property, property in the meantime that the proceedings are going on. So that it will not prejudice the right of the expropriator to be able to use it at once for the purpose that it intends to do. Like if it's a highway, you cannot just wait for the termination of the expropriation proceedings before you can start building the highway. That might considerably delay the construction of the highway. So after that, what would be done is to eventually determine how much is the just compensation. After the determination of just compensation and payment of that compensation, that's the time that ownership is now transferred to the expropriator. So we have discussed Rule 67 and Section 19 of Republic Act 7160. Now we have Republic Act number 8974. Republic Act number 8974 has something to do with the amount that has to be paid before transfer of possession. So take note, it does not refer to the amount to be deposited. Instead, payment to be made directly to the owner. So that's a radical change, you know? Instead of depositing it with the court, it, you, now, you now deliver it directly to the owner. In the case of Republic versus King Goyon, this particular law became the subject of debate between the majority led by Justice Tinga and Justice Corona for the minority. Under 8974, the zonal value of the land, if it is land, would have to be paid directly to the owner before transfer of possession. But if it is not land, then it's the cost of the improvements. Gingoyon is about Naia Terminal 3. So you remember that in, the, in that case of Agan versus Piatko, the agreement that was forged between the government and Piatko was invalidated by the Supreme Court. By the time the Supreme Court annulled that contract, Naia Terminal 3 was practically finished. That means that Piatko had already invested a lot because that agreement was supposed to be BOT, Bill Operate Transfer. So the money for the construction came from Piatko itself and which it could have recovered by operating Naia Terminal 3. But it was not allowed to do that because of the decision in Agan. So what's going to happen now to that Naia Terminal 3? The contract was invalidated. Piatko therefore cannot operate it. But the government cannot simply take it for free. It has to pay for it because it represents investment on the part of Piatko. So 8974 comes in that the government would have to pay the cost of the improvement before it can take possession. It's very simple, isn't it? Why would it involve Justice Tinga and Justice Corona in a debate? It's because of a new feature of the 1987 Constitution. If you compare the 1987 Constitution with the previous two Constitutions, 1935 and 1973, you would notice that there is a provision in both the 1935 and the 1973 Constitution that was not retained by the 1987 Charter. This has something to do with the power of the Supreme Court to promulgate rules of pleadings, practice, and procedure. 
are the 1935 and the 1973 constitutions. The legislature had the power to repeal, alter, or supplement these rules of buildings, practice, and procedure. The 1987 constitution did not have a similar provision. And in the case of Echegaray, the Supreme Court pointed out that this means that it is now solely the province of the Supreme Court to come up with procedural rules. Congress can no longer supplement, repeal, or alter the same. Still, you might be wondering, so what is there to debate about? The debate is all about characterization. Is 8974 procedural or substantive law? At first glance, one may tend to agree with the position taken by Justice Corona. It is procedural. Why? Is it simply providing for the mix, the manner by which transfer can be effected? That is, that you have to pay so much. So it's about how to implement the transfer of possession. So it makes sense, isn't it? But to just this thing, it was substantive. So, how do you look at it? Procedural or substantive? It's all about how much you have to pay before transfer of possession, which is an incident to expropriation proceedings. To properly appreciate Justice Tinga's way of arguing this case, ask yourselves, have you ever been influenced by the packaging of the products that you bought? Yes. And for the guys, have you ever been influenced perhaps by the makeup of the woman you brought home? Such that when you peeled off the makeup, you suddenly realized it was a defective product. So if you have ever been influenced by the packaging, you can only appreciate what Justice Tinga did. How he packaged his argument. He said, 8974 represents a standard of just compensation. If you put it that way, then it really sounds substantive instead of procedural, isn't it? So again, perhaps you can learn from some of these cases how you can also package your answers to make them more interesting so that you can get more from whatever ideas you put there. Just make sure it makes sense. Otherwise, the examiner might simply think you have a box without anything in it. So that's the case of Republic versus King Goyon regarding the debate between Justice Tinga and Justice Corona regarding 8974. In the case of Republic versus Holy Trinity Reality Development Corporation, it also involves 8974. But instead of the money being directly paid to the owner of the land, it was deposited in the bank in the meantime. So the issue, to whom should the interest belong? The Supreme Court said, if under 8974 the money should have been paid directly to the owner, then it follows that the interest should belong to the owner because from the time it was deposited, it was already supposed to be in his hands. 
just compensation also signifies timeliness in payment. Because if the payment is delayed, then it would no longer be just. Again, just try to remember, you lent your friend 50000 today on the promise that she would pay next week. Next week came, she did not pay. One month passed, still the same thing. One year, still the same thing. Your friend comes to you on the fifth year and now gives you your 50,000. <laughs> Is that the same? So in the same way, when it comes to this just compensation okay, thing as a consequence of delay, there may no longer be just compensation. What the Supreme Court did in the past was to provide for a manner of trying to approximate the idea of justice by imposing an interest at the rate of 12% per annum. But even that 12% may not make, make much sense to someone who would just be looking at the idea but never really having his hands on the money, isn't it? Okay, after nine years, your money might have doubled. Another nine years, it will now be tripled. Another nine years, quadrupled and so on. <laughs> so you now have much more than what you're supposed to have received initially. Let's just say that your 10 million has now become, in theory, 60 million. Nice idea, isn't it? But in the meantime, you may already be living in misery because you have nothing for your property. <laughs> so how would that be just? Then, the Supreme Court came up with something new in 2005. Is that your first year? Okay, be defensive. In 2005, the Supreme Court decided the case of Republic versus State. It has something to do with someone who had been asking for the payment for the land that was expropriated from him or his predecessor in interest more than 50 years ago. As a matter of fact, Lim here is not the original owner. It's just the transferring of the signing. Because the original owner might have simply had to borrow from Lim because he cannot wait for the payment to come. So can you imagine 50 years? <laughs> You just add 50 to, your, 50 to your years now, and it will be something like 80. Six. Six. So what was the new doctrine announced by the Supreme Court in Lim? The Supreme Court said the expropriator must pay within five years from finality of the judgment. Otherwise, the owner may demand return of the possession. So why return of possession? Because as we have explained earlier, it's only the possession that has been transferred in the meantime. There is yet a transfer of ownership because there has been no payment of just compensation yet. The case was referred to in subsequent cases. Perhaps just to make sure that everyone knew that the Supreme Court was serious. Five years from finality of judgment. It was reiterated in the case of Uwiko versus Atienza, as well as the case of Ingoyan. 
Where did the Supreme Court get the five-year period? From the rule on execution of judgment by motion. So you have to do that by motion within five years. Otherwise, if you don't, then you would have to revive the judgment by filing another option. You know? The case of Lim may be practical for the application of that rule. But for some others, it might not. Why? In the case of Lim, what was involved was Lahook Airport in Cebu. If you go to Cebu now, you would not land in Lahook Airport. Instead, you would be landing at the Mactan Cebu International Airport. And then you would cross the bridge to the, to the Cebu Island itself. And if you were to pass through that area where Lahook Airport is, you would not recognize it. Because it is no longer an airport. It has already been abandoned in favor of Mactan Cebu International Airport. Therefore, it is practical to order the return of possession. Because there is no more airport in that area. But if the land was taken to form part of the South Expressway, and your land happens to be in the middle, okay, they return your land in the middle of the South Expressway. Every time you go home, you run the risk of being immediately sent to hell. So let's just see how it would develop in the future. But for now, as I said, in the case of Lahook Airport, it was practical. The case of Lahook Airport also gave rise to other interesting cases on eminent domain. Lahook Airport has been abandoned. Can the former owners repurchase the lands that used to belong to them? The general rule when it comes to that is a rule that traces its roots way back to Ferry versus Municipality of Cabalatuan. In that case, the Supreme Court said that the former owner would have no right to recover the property or to repurchase the property that has been expropriated unless there was a reservation to that effect in the judgment of expropriation. In a recent case decided by the Supreme Court, Mactan Cebu International Airport versus Nusada, the Supreme Court revisited that rule and came up with something new. So the new rule now is the owner may recover, may repurchase. How did the Supreme Court arrive at that? Again, it has something to do with the value of property in a free society. When a property is expropriated, that's really forcing the owner to give up his property. And the reason for that is it is for the higher goal of serving public use for a particular purpose. Therefore, if eventually the purpose for which you ousted the owner no longer exists because you are now going to devote it to some other purpose, then you should allow the former owner to gain back that property that you forced out of him. Or if the government would like to devote it to another use, then it must institute again the appropriate proceedings for that particular purpose that it wants to devote the property. So under Nusada, the former owner may be entitled to repurchase the property if the purpose for which the property has been expropriated is abandoned or the property is to be devoted to some other use. 
that was decided, I think, a few months back. Theoretically, it's not supposed to be within your coverage, right? Anyway, even if certain things that we discuss are outside the coverage, are we only talking about the bar? How about after, when you've already been practiced? Yes. Yes. You would not only have to wait for the MCLE, isn't it? Because you would be the ones to now educate the older people. I don't know who was the one who said before that when you are preparing for the bar, that is the time when you know most about everything. If you would be employed in law offices after you pass the bar, or even when you haven't passed the bar yet, while you're waiting for the results, you may notice that some of the older experienced lawyers may ask you certain questions about the newer jurisprudence. And the reason for that is, since you just took your bar, then you would be more updated than they are. Does it flatter you? So that's the case of Mactansabu International Airport versus Lusada. Another case involving Mactansabu International Airport is the one of the heirs of Moreno and Rodea. In that case, the spouses of Moreno and Rodea also owned the piece of land in that area that was to be devoted to the Lampug Airport. And when the government wanted to acquire those lands, it initially tried to, to negotiate with the owners for the sale of these lands. To those who were willing to sell, or one of the inducements in order to make them sell, was the promise that if the project, the Lahog Airport, would be abandoned, then the former owners would be allowed to repurchase. The spouses Moreno and Rodea refused to sell. So, the government instituted expropriation proceedings against them. And with that, they were helpless to oppose the acquisition of their land by the government. Now, the whole airport is no longer there. It has been abandoned. Can the heirs repurchase the land that used to belong to their parents? The government said no. You have to remember that that offer was made to those who were willing to sell. Their parents refused to sell. They forced us to institute expropriation proceedings. So the promise would not be applicable to them. Logical, isn't it? But again, you know how lawyers are, especially Supreme Court justices. The Supreme Court came up with a way out. The Supreme Court explained, property is one of the cherished rights in society. People may want to cling on to their property as much as they can. They wouldn't like to sell for any price. That may have been the case with the parents of these children. However, since the government in this case really needed the land and it instituted expropriation proceedings, then these parents were unable to resist the need of the government to take their property. So, through expropriation, they lost their land. Considering the value given to a person's right 
to own and to keep, then you cannot take it against the parents that they resisted the government as much as they can. They were simply protecting their right. So if they refused to sell, but they were eventually coerced or compelled to part with their property through expropriation proceedings, still you must hold the government to its promise to allow the owners or the former owners to repurchase. That was a promise made to the landowners when they were approached. So it does not matter that the owners <coughs> refused to sell and instead had to part with their properties because of expropriation. Accordingly, Supreme Court said, allow the heirs to repurchase. So that's the case of heirs of Moreno and Rotella. Let's say that a local government unit had appropriated 5 million pesos for the expropriation of a property. So after that, it instituted the appropriate expropriation proceeding. After trial, the trial court ordered expropriation and the just compensation at the amount of 10 million pesos. So it's 5 million more than what was appropriated. The local government unit did not appeal. The decision became final. Then it realized it couldn't afford to pay that price. But the decision has already become final. Can it still withdraw from the expropriation? In the case of Ortega versus the city of Cebu, the Supreme Court said it cannot be done anymore because the decision has already become final. But the amount that was appropriated is only 5 million and it's not sufficient. So how would the 5 million be satisfied? Can it be by mere motion with the court? The, court, the Supreme Court said no. It must be by another action, mandamus, to compel the Sanburian of that LGU to appropriate the additional 5 million pesos. So that's the case of, of city of Cebu again. When you go to the provinces, you may have noticed that parallel to the highway or crisscrossing the highway and the farms are the transmission lines of the National Power Corporation. The lands that they traverse are presumptively private property, private farms. How much should be paid for those lands traversed by the transmission lines? The Supreme Court, in several cases, rejected the claim of National Power Corporation that pursuant to its charter should only be paid an easement fee equivalent to 10%. So if you would notice, it's only the towers that touch the land. Between towers would be open space, and normally this would be planted to the same crops in the outlying areas, isn't it? So how much should be paid? The Supreme Court said the value of the land affected. Why? Because these transmission lines are more or less permanent structures that now deprive the owners of the normal use of their property, and at the same time they also pose a danger to the owners. 
because of the nature of the, these transmission lines. So not merely the 10% as provided for in the charter of the National Power Corporation. Then in the case of Ibrahim, we have a situation where what's involved are subterranean tunnels. So instead of overhead, underground, unseen. Sometime in the 1980s, the National Power Corporation built these tunnels under the property of, among others, Ibrahim. They're about more than 100 meters deep or down from the surface. Nobody seems to know about the construction of these tunnels, especially the, the surface owners. Then, one time in the 90s, Ibrahim wanted to dig a deep well in his property. So he tried to get the appropriate government clearance for that. And he was told he cannot build or he cannot dig a deep well. Why? Because it would endanger the tunnels under his property. And that was the only time that he learned, and to his surprise, that there were tunnels under his property. He never knew. Because of that, he filed a case against National Power Corporation to stop them from using tunnels or to pay him just compensation. The National Power Corporation said, why should we be paying you? We did not disturb your surface rights. The tunnels are well below, one, more than 100 meters below the surface. They are subterranean. So you don't have any right to claim anything. The Supreme Court said, National Power Corporation, you're wrong. The owner has the right to the beneficial enjoyment of things even under his property. And so far as you claim that his surface rights have not been affected. The court said you're wrong. Precisely because of your tunnels, he cannot dig his deep well. So how much should be paid? The Supreme Court applying the same rule in regard to overhead transmission lines says it should be the value of the land affected. Now, how do you value it? At the time when the tunnels were constructed or at the time of discovery? Napopor said at the time the tunnels were constructed. The Supreme Court said no. Since you did not even inform the owner about the construction of these tunnels, then you suffered the consequence. So you should pay the value of the land at the time when Ibrahim discovered about the presence of these tunnels. Let's take a break.